All right, good morning, everybody. Um, today we're going to go over a couple things. I want to first go over the rubric for the um, writing the argumentative essay. And there's some really important things in here that I really want to stress. Um, there's some changes, those of you who came to the review sessions, um, there's been some changes to the, the test with the modified form. And I want to go over very clearly what you need to do. And then there's a, a short YouTube video I'm going to show you um, that kind of reiterates some of this stuff, um, which I think is, is really, really helpful. Um, we're then going to finish the lesson one or the unit one review today. So we'll kind of wrap that up. Um, and then we'll do unit two tomorrow, unit three on, on Friday, um, just to make sure that we have everything uh, before your test on Monday. Okay, so what you see here is the rubric for the argumentative essay. And you see here at the top that it says it is a seven point rubric. Um, so this is the maximum number of points that you can earn on this question. And your rubric is going to start with a question. I'm sorry, your, your, your essay is going to start with, the, with your thesis. And it's really, really critical that you address your thesis in a certain way, because if you don't, there will be points that you are unable to earn if you do not get the thesis correct. So they're going to pose a question. It's going to say something like this. Um, explain which of the three branches of government is most um, um, harmful, potentially, to the American people. Okay, so let's say they have a question like that. Okay, your thesis is going to start out with, it's going to have to have two pieces of information. Okay, I'm going to say something, for instance, the legislative branch of government is most harmful to the American people. Okay, that addresses the part of the question because, and then I'm going to state the reasons why I believe it's the most harmful to the American people. If you do not have both the answer to their question, which one you believe is most harmful, and the because part that explains why you believe it is, you will not earn the first point for your thesis, and you cannot earn subsequent points down here below when we get to the pieces of evidence. So basically out of the seven point question, if your thesis is not, if you don't earn that thesis point, the most points you can earn on this question would be three, okay, out of seven. So it's very critical that you spell out that thesis and you answer it very precisely. Now, you can see here under decision rules and scoring notes, it says responses that do not earn the point um, is if you simply just restate their prompt or if your thesis does not make a claim that responds to the prompt. So if you don't directly answer the question, you're not gonna get that point, okay? Responses that earn the point, this is the claim or thesis responds to the prompt rather than restating or rephrasing the prompt and it establishes a line of reasoning. Why I believe that this is going to be the, the, the branch of government that is most harmful to the American people. So you need both the what you think it is and then the why. Okay. Now, in your paragraphs below, you're going to go into the reasoning through the documents. But you have to at first have that evidence that you need to be able to lay out there. Now, Row B um, here goes to your first piece of evidence, and they're going to offer you a couple different documents, and we'll see this in the video I'm going to show you here in a second, that you can kind of walk through, and you have to pick one of those nine required documents that, that I've talked about the last two days to back up your point. And you can see here that on this first piece of evidence, you can earn anywhere between zero and four points. Okay, Now, a zero point um, paper is something that you can see here Responses that do not earn points do not provide any accurate evidence, so that document that you've picked doesn't back up whatever your claim happens to be, or the evidence that you picked is not relevant to the topic. So you need to make sure that what you're selecting fits the argument that you're trying to make. So if I'm trying to say that Congress is the most dangerous um, of the branches of government, I might want to pull something from the Anti-Federalist Papers that may argue about um, the dangers of having a strong centralized government and, and, and talking about the powers of Congress and, or, or something like that, uh, where I, I can very clearly make that connection between those two pieces. Now, um, historically, um, this next section, this was only a three-point section before because you, you used to have, have to have the rebuttal, and they've taken out the rebuttal, so you don't have to make the other side's argument anymore. Uh, for this year's test, like you would have in, if, you, if this was the regular test. So this used to be worth um, anywhere between 0 and 3 points. Now it's worth between 0 and 4. Now, you can see here, if you want to earn one point, okay, you're going to provide one example of evidence that is relevant to the topic. Okay, um, And it's that 
piece of evidence you provide may or may not necessarily prove your thesis, but it is at least relevant. If you do that, okay, you're going to get one point. Okay, To get two points, you're going to provide two examples of evidence that are relevant to the topic. And again, those two pieces of evidence may not necessarily back up your thesis, but if you provide two things that are at least relevant um, to the topic, then you can earn up to two points there. Now, what's going to earn you three or four points here? To get three points, it says you must provide two, two pieces of specific evidence that are relevant to the topic. One of those pieces of evidence must support the claim or thesis. Okay. To get four points, okay, one of those pieces of evidence must come from a foundational document listed in the prompt. The other piece of evidence can come from a different foundational document or knowledge of course content, but both of those must back up your, your claim or thesis. So basically here, if you make a thesis statement, okay, and then you can pull two pieces of information that are relevant sources that back up what your thesis is, you can earn the full four points here. Now again, you only have 25 minutes to write, but the more you write, the more detailed you are in what you are saying, the better off you're going to be. This is a chance for you to show them what you've learned this year. Hey, write in as much detail as you can to be able to answer those questions in as much detail as possible. Now, part C is the reasoning, okay? So it's not just that I've presented the evidence, okay? This is where I'm going to provide reasoning. I'm going to explain the relationship between the evidence that I pre presented and the claim or thesis. If I can do that for one of my pieces of evidence, I can get an additional point here. If I can do that for both of my pieces of evidence, then I can get two points. So that's how I would, I would earn the seven points that we have um, for this question. Now, you do not have to do the rebuttal, okay? In past years, it would be something where they would say, like, other people might say that the, the executive branch is the most dangerous because um, you don't have to do that anymore, okay? So whatever your argument is going to be, you need to back that up with a couple pieces of information. So this is a seven-point question, okay? If your thesis is well-written, okay, that's an easy point to earn there, and then you just have to find documents or pieces of evidence that link to that. Now, one of the pieces of evidence must be from those nine required documents, and they will tell you that on the, on the question. Now, the example he's going to go over in this video is from last year, um, and this does a pretty good job of, of, of seeing an example of, of how they would do this. Now, in this video, he's going to ask you to pause the video and to read the question. I would like you to actually do that. So just read the question before he starts going over it. Some of you who co have come to the review sessions have seen this question already, uh, but Read the question and see how you would respond to this, okay? Particularly given the knowledge of the of the pieces of information that you have. So this video is short; it's about it's about five six minutes. Um, I'm just going to show you this really quickly. Um, this gives you a, kind of an overview of how to write this essay, and I think he does a really good job at this. So um, we'll go through the rest of the review here in just a second. Maybe you already heard the news that 60% of your coronavirus AP Gov score is going to be based off the argument essay alone. I know that sounds terrifying. But trust me, when you finish watching this video, you're going to feel much, much better about this insane plot twist. Now, you're only going to have 25 minutes to write this version of the argument essay, but here's the good news. They've made it easier to write and easier to earn points. So let's get right to the details. Here's the 2019 released argument essay. I deleted the alternative perspective stuff since it's not on this year's exam anyway. I encourage you to pause the video for a moment to read the entirety of this prompt. Hit play when you finish. Okay, welcome back. So the first thing you have to do is write a thesis statement. You do not need to write an intro. You don't need to do anything besides what I tell you to do in this video. Your first sentence should be your thesis statement. There are two parts to your thesis statement. First is to write the claim or thesis statement that responds to the prompt. So in this case, saying whether expanded powers of national government either benefits or hinders policymaking. That's first. You must also establish a line of reasoning. So let's see what that looks like. Notice the thesis statement. The expanding powers of the national government benefits policymaking overall. So that's the first part of the claim. And the line of reasoning, because it prevents delays such as states making conflicting laws. So this statement earns the point because it both makes the claim that expanded national government power benefits policymaking and it also establishes the line of reasoning by using the word because. I want you to write your thesis statement just like that. 
This point is by far the most important part of the essay. In fact, there are four other points on this FRQ that you cannot receive if you don't earn the thesis point. Okay, so that's your first paragraph. Even if it's just one sentence, I want it to be its own standalone paragraph. Now you have to write the rest of the essay. You need two pieces of evidence, and at least one piece of evidence has to be from one of the documents on the list. Make it as easy as possible for the reader to find your points. So make the first piece of evidence a new paragraph. Begin by identifying which document your evidence is coming from, and then identify the evidence that you're using. That's the first point. Describe the evidence and show that it's relevant to your thesis statement, and finally explain how your evidence supports your thesis. This is where you'll do your typical explain thing. Elaborate, provide evidence, or give an example, and make sure to close the loop. Now remember that every word in the prompt matters. So in this example, you're not explaining why expanded national power is good or bad. You're explaining how it helps or hinders policymaking. So your explanation needs to focus on how policymaking specifically is affected. This evidence paragraph is worth three points. Let's take a look at a sample answer that earned all the possible points. The first point is earned for providing one piece of evidence that is relevant to the prompt. The first sentence identifies that under the articles, the national government was weaker than state governments. That is an accurate piece of evidence, relevant to the prompt, and therefore earns one point. The second point is earned for providing a piece of evidence that is specific and relevant and supports your thesis. The next couple of sentences point out that under the articles, the federal government lacked the ability to tax and therefore couldn't afford a standing army, and was then unable to put down Shays Rebellion. Now, you might notice that this isn't particularly well written, nor is it even totally accurate, but they did what they had to do to earn the second point, and that's really all that matters. The third point is earned for using reasoning to explain how or why the evidence supports the thesis. This is the toughest point to earn, so you've got to do your explain thing. This student argues that the articles provide evidence that increased federal power is beneficial, and here comes the key word, because the lack of that power caused rebellions within the country that weren't put down efficiently due to the weak federal government. If the national government had been stronger, the student claims that Shays' rebellion would have been stopped more quickly. This successfully explains the relationship between the evidence that had been previously described and the thesis, earning the third point in this paragraph. So that's paragraph two. Paragraph three, do it all again with your second piece of evidence. It's the exact same process. You can't use the same document as you used in your first piece of evidence, but you can use any document, listed or unlisted, Supreme Court cases, or anything else from your knowledge of the entire course from AP government. So you do it again. Same idea. Identify where your evidence is coming from, describe the evidence, show how it's relevant, and then explain how that piece of evidence supports your thesis statement. So to recap, it's three paragraphs. Your first paragraph is the thesis statement. That's where you make your claim and establish a line of reasoning. That's worth one point. The second paragraph is your first piece of evidence. It's where you identify, describe, and explain how your evidence supports your thesis statement. That's worth three points. The third paragraph is the same as the second paragraph, just a new piece of evidence. Again, identify, describe, and explain how that piece of evidence supports your thesis statement. That's another three points. So that's seven points total, and that's it. You're all done. See, and you thought this was going to be tough. That's it. Now, the way he explained this was a, was a little bit different than the way the rubric is listed, because the rubric talks about the fact that you have the four points in the second section, the, third, the two points in the third section. Basically, the way he broke this up is he basically said, okay, in, in section B, you're getting two points for one document and two points for the other document. And then the reasoning down in part C is, is one point for the first document, one point for the second document. So this is kind of the same idea. Um, he's, he just presents it a little bit differently. But what you can see here is that you really only need three sent three paragraphs. And the first paragraph should be your thesis. And that could really be one sentence if you, if you explain it well. So it should, it should be a fairly lengthy sentence, not something where you're writing a three-word writing prompt or something like that. Um, but you want to make sure that that's detailed using the word because and you heard him say repeatedly there make sure you close the loop if you start to if you start to say something like okay shay's rebellion showed the weaknesses of of the federal government under the articles confederation then you kind of close that loop well why did that matter 
Okay, so that mattered because because it showed the weaknesses of the federal government. It caused us to go out and write a new constitution. Had the federal government been stronger under Shays' Rebellion, um, we would have maybe never needed the, uh, a new constitution. So it really kind of addressed the weaknesses of that document. So again, and you saw in that second piece, he, he used a Supreme Court case. So he used Shaw versus Reno as the Supreme Court case that, he, that they chose there. So you can use for that second piece of evidence anything that you want. It does not have to be one of those nine required documents, but it can be. If you know those nine documents well and you think that, that two of them fit, by all means, use those two. Now, we obviously don't know what that prompt's going to be. It could be anything. Uh, but the, what I really want you to, to stress here is that one of those two pieces has to be from one of those nine required documents. So you making sure that you know those nine documents is really important because that's going to be something that you're definitely going to have to use on the test. Okay. All right. So that's the first of the two extended responses. The second of the two extended responses is just going to be what, what they call concept application. So they're probably going to give you a chart or a graph to interpret. This will be something that you can't just Google and look up the answer. They're going to ask you to interpret something of that for that chart or graph, why it's important. And then they're probably going to ask you a couple of follow-up questions to that about how that, whatever that topic is, how that links to other information in the course. And I'll go, I'll go over an example of one of those tomorrow for you, um, so you so that you can see that. But again, I really want to stress here, this is 25 minutes. Okay, this is I, I know that's a fairly short amount of time. It may seem like it's a lot of time, but if you're having to spend a lot of that 25 minutes looking up what these documents are, and I don't know how we're gonna how how to address this or anything like that, then you're gonna be wasting a lot of that time. The more detail that you can give them, the better. Okay, so just write, make sure that you you make connections, link it back to the thesis. Go, why does this prove my point that this is um, superior to whatever the other thing happens to be or, or however they're going to address this question. Okay, so I want to make sure we went through that in some detail. Um, this rubric is out on the website. All I did is I googled um, AP Government uh, 2020 rubric uh, that took you right to this page. So uh, you, you can all you can look this up online. This might be something if you want to have this printed out as well next to your um, next to your computer when you, um, when, you when you do your typing. Um, that, that will probably be good. I did want to address one other thing here real quick um, regarding some information I got from, from the district today. Um, if you are using um, Google Chrome uh, for, your, for your writing um, for, the, for the actual test, Google Chrome, it appears, may have the Grammarly um, app attached to it. So it may not open for your test. So uh, I, I remember I went in one of the previous videos, I suggested possibly using multiple web browsers. You can probably get it so that you could have different tabs open uh, at the same time. If you're using everything in Safari and you just separate the tabs out um, onto separate pages and then split screen it, that, that might be your best bet. So you can still see the question in the clock while you're writing in your Google Doc. Um, if you're using Google Chrome, there's a chance that may not load. Now, nobody seemed to have a problem with that with the demo, so it may not be, be that way on our iPads, but I had a couple of uh, teachers today mention that the Grammarly app in Google Chrome is one of the add-ons that's, that's available, um, so I don't know if that's going to be problematic or not, but I did want to address that just in case um, anybody has problems opening, opening, their, opening their test, that if you go directly into Safari, you will not have any issues with that. Okay, all right. I'm going to go very briefly through the rest of Unit 1 real quick just to kind of touch on some things we left off on Topic 1-4. Uh, topic 1-5 talked about ratification of the Constitution, some very important things that you need to make sure that you, that you know. Um, it says here, learning objective, explain the ongoing impact of political negotiation and compromise at the Constitutional Convention on the development of our system. As you can recall, they didn't agree on anything. So big states, small states were fighting, North and South fighting over slavery. Um, all these things, nothing was set in stone. So um, the entire Constitution was based upon a series of compromises. And on the right side here, it goes over four important ones of those that you need to make sure you know. So the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise was kind of this mushed together version of the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan, which was our big state and our small state plans for what the, what the government was going to look like. So under the, the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise is what gave us our bicameral legislature. One house based on population, one house based on equality that came from, from that compromise, um, as well as a series of other things that, that were laid out in terms of what the executive branch would look like, the judicial branch would look like. So all of that comes through 
the Great Compromise. And you may want to take take a look back at that. It's in the Chapter 2 PowerPoint. Um, if you don't remember that, all of that's out on, on the website that you can review. The Electoral College was a compromise. And this was a compromise between who gets to pick who the president is. And we kind of had this big debate that was firing between how much do we trust the American people? Do we trust them to elect our president through a popular vote, a direct vote of the people? Or do we think that the legislature should be the ones who picks the president? So the Electoral College was kind of a hybrid version of both of those, in that under the Electoral College, the people vote, but you're voting for electors to go to the Electoral College and make decisions for you. Um, so again, it's not a direct election. It's not direct, direct democracy. Um, it's this idea of representative democracy. You're letting people go and represent you at the Electoral College and make those decisions. The Three-Fifths Compromise um, dealt with slavery. Um, remember, the southern states wanted slaves counted as, um, as citizens for the purposes of representation in the House of Representatives. The northern states uh, did not approve of that. Um, what they ended up with was the Three-Fifths Compromise, whereas a slave would count for three-fifths of a person um, as it re related to representation in the House of Representatives. So uh, that was another one of the compromises that they made there. They also compromised on the importation of slaves. Uh, we didn't really talk about that a whole lot, but there was a lot of debate about should we ban the slave trade, and they kicked the can down the road there. They basically said, we'll address this later. We're not going to uh, really address it now. Uh, second section here under C2, it says debates about self-government during the drafting of the Constitution necessitated the drafting of an amendment process, which was detailed in Article 5, as they realized that we're going to have to amend this document at some point. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, we need to make sure that we amend this at some point. So Article 5 of the Constitution lays out how you do that. So remember Article 5, it takes a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress or a proposal from two-thirds of the state le legislatures to amend the Constitution. Once that has passed, it then takes three quarters of the states to ratify that change. So again, or if you remember under the Articles of Confederation, it took every single colony to amend the Articles of Confederation. Here, it still takes a lot. It's still hard to do it, but it takes two thirds to propose it and then three quarters to actually ratify in terms of the states. Now, those compromises, as well as the promise of a Bill of Rights, were necessary to secure ratification, because there were a lot of things we knew if we tried to force um, the banning of slavery uh, into the Constitution, the southern states were never going to approve it. It never would have got adopted. We knew that if we didn't um, put something in there in terms of the Bill of Rights, that the Anti-Federalists were never going to support the document. So there were all sorts of compromises that were made. And the whole, the whole idea here was that we were trying to fix the weaknesses in the Articles, um, and we wanted to create this system of limited government. We wanted to make sure that government had power, but not too much power, but we wanted to make sure that they were able to do what they needed to do to address some of the things that they couldn't do under the Articles of Confederation, such as tax or raise an army or things like that. So all of that was critical in terms of negotiation. Now, under essential knowledge, it also talks about the fact that the debate over the role of central government and the powers of states and the rights of individuals remains um, an issue today. This is something that we talk about all of these things. Post 9-11, we had all of our government surveillance. So what are government powers that they should be able to take over us? Um, and what is too far? Where is the line um, that, that's drawn there? We also have the debate uh, as it relates to the federal government and education. Education is technically a police power. We know that the federal government has a big say in, in education because they have money. And the states who have asked for help in the past take that money and in the process forfeit some of their um, constitutional uh, jobs that they're supposed to be doing. So those are all things that are in the Constitution. So it's the articles, it's the amendments. So if you're asked a question and you can think, well, I think this ties to this article, you can cite the Constitution. So that would be the document that you would cite um, if you need to go that route. So that would be a required foundational document that you could use if that was your extended response. Uh, one six is principles of American government. Um, and this is just the idea of making sure you know the idea of separation of powers and checks and balances and why those things are important. So we'll go specifically over those things tomorrow in Unit 2, but make sure that you know specific powers that are allocated to Congress, the President, and the courts, and how those powers allow our government to function and create this separation that keeps any one person from getting too much power. 
Um, Federalist 51 um, is obviously the key document there. Federalist 51 explains the constitutional provisions of checks and balances. Um, you did a, an assignment over that at the beginning of the year. If you want to revisit that, okay, analytical, analytical reading 51 right here over on the left side, um, you can click on that. Hey, you also need to know um, this, this second section here. It says explain the implications of those on the American political system. Um, and really the idea here, if you look down in this section right here, is it talks about impeachment, removal from offices of public officials who have abused their power, reflect the purpose of checks and balances. When Richard Nixon was, was going to get impeached before he resigned, that was, that was what the framers had intended. You had a president who had abused their power, and Congress was stepping in to hold that president accountable for that through the process of impeachment. So when you have that situation occur, the, the framers intended for Congress to be able to step in and to remove the president from office. Similarly, when Congress does something that they pass a law that, that violates the Constitution, we expect the Supreme Court to step in and rule that unconstitutional. Um, that's something that the court should be able to do as, as their role in checks and balances. So we have all of those these pieces, and we'll make, make sure that you know why checks and balances are so important um, to the way our government functions. And we'll go over some specifics there, but, but back in chapter chapters two and three, particularly when we introduced federalism in chapter three, we looked at specific powers of the federal government versus the states, and we looked at specific powers of each of the branches of government in chapters 13, 14, and 16. So those were the big, uh, big chapters on branches of government. All that stuff should be in tab two of your binder. That's all unit two stuff, which we'll review a little bit tomorrow. Uh, but that all kind of links back to this idea of checks and balances, which was introduced in Unit 1. Uh, one seven talks about the relationship between the state and federal government. Obviously, the key thing here is the Tenth Amendment. You need to make sure that you understand the Tenth Amendment. There are some available resources here, and this second one in particular, I think, is really, really good. It talks about federalism, the Commerce Clause, so the idea of interstate commerce, and the Tenth Amendment, and how all of those things link together. So that was not something that I assigned, but it is available out there to you. Um, it's out in AP Classroom that you can access. Um, that'll give you some additional work on Tenth Amendment stuff if you if you need to review that. Um, it says here, uh, learning objective students need to be able to explain how societal needs affect the constitutional allocation of power between the national and state governments. So if you look at societal needs, and I think the coronavirus outbreak now is a great a great example of this. What does our country need right now? Well, our country needs jobs. Our country needs tests so we can test people uh, for for the coronavirus. Um, our country needs some sort of um, vaccine um, for, for, this, for this disease. So the thing that if we look at, this is what our country needs as a whole. Now, some of those things are state functions. So obviously anything related to health, so that would be testing vaccines, things like that, those are state functions. But we see the federal government having a big role in this, particularly in the vaccine and the funding through um, some of our federal agencies. And, and again, societal needs sometimes influence who does what. And it's not always just as simple as, well, whose power is this according to the Constitution? Sometimes things change. And it and makes sure that uh, things happen maybe a little bit differently than they've happened in the past. Now, I really want you to pay attention to this paragraph right here. Okay, It talks about the distribution of balance of power between the federal and state governments to meet the needs of society changes as reflected by grants, incentives, and aid programs. So uh, again, and they give you some examples here. So federal revenue sharing. So revenue sharing is when money is collected and the federal government and the states agree to share that money. So a great example of that would be the gas tax. So the federal government collects a tax on gasoline. They share some of that money with the states to, to uh, pave roads and things like that, and the federal government keeps some. So that was, a, an, that was an idea when the gas tax was passed. It was passed to be a revenue sharing bill so that both layers of government could benefit from that. Talks about mandates. Remember, we have funded versus unfunded mandates. So an unfunded mandate is when government tells you you have to do something, um, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act. They don't give you any money to do it. You must make your buildings handicap accessible. Just do it. We're not going to give you any funding. Just figure out a way to get it done. A funded mandate is when government tells you to do something and then they give you the money to do it. So states are fine with funded mandates. They're not always as fine with unfunded mandates. 
Uh, obviously, Americans with Disabilities Act, that could be a second source that you could use. So if you needed, um, say you got a topic that had to do something with unfunded mandates or something like that, you could use the Americans with Disabilities Act as your second piece of information um, that you used on the AP tab uh, for, that, for that second required document that you could talk about. So uh, that's why we looked at that a little bit earlier this year as well. Um, categorical grants and block grants, remember the, um, that those are very different. Categorical grants for the federal government tells you how you spend money and it breaks it down for you. Uh, block grants is when they give states flexibility to spend money how they want. So let's say I'm going to give a state $5 million, and if I give them a $5 million categorical grant, I'm going to tell them that a million of it has to be spent on personnel, 500000 has to be spent on supplies, and I may even break that down further in terms of specific supplies that they have to buy, things like that. A block grant is, here's $5 million, make sure you spend it on education, or whatever the case may be. So um, those types of grants are different. So please make sure you know the differences between those types of uh, grants and aid programs. That's obviously very important here. Uh, topic 1.8, constitutional interpretations of federalism. And this is where we get into a couple of our required cases and how things have changed. So um, if you, again, and they have these for all these cases. If you look down here in the corner, it's got links to um, available cases. And I just clicked on the one for um, McCulloch versus Maryland. Obviously, it will take you to AP Classroom where you can sign in. And if you go out there, it's going to give you a, a very specific link um, with information about that document. So if, you, if there's cases that you don't remember, obviously, I did the case review a couple days ago. But if you click on these links on the side of the page here, it will take you down to additional information about that. It will be required that you log into AP Classroom. Uh, but if you do that, you'll be able to access those things. Um, now, also here it talks about the, the key of the 10th and the 14th Amendments and the role that those have played in helping define the relationship between the state and federal government. So obviously the 10th Amendment is clear. Um, any powers not listed in the Constitution go to the states. So that's very clearly about the, about the relationship between those layers of government. But the 14th Amendment is also key as well. And the 14th Amendment is key because of this idea of the Commerce Clause and it's key because of the idea of selective incorporation, um, is that we've selectively incorporated the Bill of Rights to the state. So not only do, are these things that protect us from the federal government, but they're also things that are going to protect us from the states as well. So, uh, And again, interpretations of different things have changed over time. We talked about the fact that the Second Amendment was just um, incorporated to the states back in 2010. Uh, parts of the Constitution dealing with illegal search and seizure, things like that, were only um, incorporated the states last year, back in 2019. So um, some of these are new. Um, it, it hasn't been um, in place for a long time. Um, it talks about the Necessary and Proper Clause. Remember, the Necessary and Proper Clause is also called the Elastic Clause. So that's the clause that allows government to do things beyond what is specifically listed in the Constitution. Um, that came from this case down here. So this is McCulloch versus Maryland. That, that really kind of helped define what that meant. Um, just kind of cut backtrack here really quick. The Commerce Clause um, has to do with interstate commerce. So generally, if the federal government is able to loosely tie something to interstate commerce, then the federal government can have control over that thing. Um, the courts have kind of backtracked on that a little bit recently in that they've been less likely to say that everything in the world is interstate commerce. The case that gave us that is right here. So this is United States versus Lopez. This kind of backtracked and said, well, not everything in the world is interstate commerce. You have to very clearly make connections as opposed to just saying that, oh, if something crosses state lines, then it, that, that's guaranteed to be interstate commerce. Not necessarily the case anymore. So those two cases are really, really critical. Um, and again, cases can be used as pieces of evidence. So if you're ever asked to talk about um, the relationship between the state and federal government, as, as, as your argumentative essay, you could tie that back to these cases and why, um, say, the federal government is overstepping their bounds as it relates to the states. And you can use U.S. v. Lopez as an example of, 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 of the courts agreeing with that, that the federal government had tried for so long to say that everything in the world was interstate commerce, and now they're going to kind of backtrack on that. Okay, so obviously it's got up here on the left side some, some required readings that aren't, aren't, or some things that aren't required here, but you can link to this. So obviously a New Deal legislation, the states fought back a lot against the New Deal, saying the federal government was overstepping their bounds. The Defense of Marriage Act, where the federal government basically said, we're going to define marriage, and even though states you can issue licenses, marriage licenses, we're going to basically say what marriage is from the perspective of the federal government, and sometimes that isn't exactly what the states say it is. Um, 
obviously no child left behind. That was a piece of legislation um, that uh, basically established federal standards for education. That led to fights with the states because the states ultimately get to control education. And then that Violence Against Women Act, <clears throat> which led to that Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Morrison that we talked about during the school year. Now, that's not one of the required cases, but that's basically where the Violence Against Women Act allowed you to um, sue in federal court um, for any sort of domestic violence or rape or anything like that. And the court stepped in and said that's a violation of the Constitution, that that needs to be a state law, not a federal law. So all of those documents, all of those cases that we've talked about all year kind of reflect this relationship between the federal government and the state governments and how that relationship has changed over time. So, again, required document here would be the Constitution if you're asked to talk about um, this topic. Some required Supreme Court cases that you can use as your secondary source would be McCulloch v. Merrill under U.S. v. Lopez. Hey. A couple more things, and we're almost done here. Uh, 1.9 talks about federalism in action. It talks about kind of the distribution of power between these different levels. Um, it talks about under C1 here, under essential knowledge, multiple access points for stakeholders and institutions to influence public policy flows from the allocation of powers between national and state government. And really what that means when it says multiple access points is that you can get things done at the local level, you can get it done at the state level, you can get it done at the federal level. So if you get shot down at one level, you have other places that you can go. You have other members of Congress that you can go to. If, if the Democrats don't like what I have to say, maybe the Republicans will like it. Maybe they'll be able to get something done. So you have multiple access points, and you have those access, as access points through these linkage institutions. So the media, interest groups, political parties, they all kind of link people to their government. It also talks about the fact that national policymaking is constrained by this sharing of power. So if President Trump wants something done nationally, the states can say no. President Trump wants to open up the economy very, very quickly, but states ultimately have the power to open up their states or not open up their states. So this, this sharing of power can constrain some sort of national policymaking. So um, obviously you have, a, you have a, a really key world event that's happening right now that you can make connections back to in this exam um, to really kind of link the power of the federal government to the state versus the state government. Now, I will advise you once again, please, whatever you do in your comments, to, to keep politics out of it, because you don't know who's going to be grading your test, somebody who agrees with you or may disagree with you. So you need to write this down very much down the middle, but you can easily connect this back to world events and things that are happening right now. Hey, and okay, that's all for unit one. So um, that's I wanted what I wanted to get through today. Um, again, this is tab one in your binder. It's chapters one through three in your book. Um, this is the constitutional overview stuff that you should have knowledge of, as well as federalism. If you have any specific questions over these units, please let me know. Um, we will pick up tomorrow with unit two. We'll also do a little bit of uh, uh, rubric analysis on that second extended response question. If anybody has any specific questions, please let me know. Again, no assignments for the rest of the quarter that are going to be graded. Um, but I'd strongly advise everybody, if you did not get a chance to go out and do those, that timed practice test that they have on that, uh, on the AP classroom, um, I'm sorry, on the AP's uh, YouTube site, um, do that as well. Um, they have another one coming out today, so there'll be a second extended response that they'll throw out there today and give you the answers tomorrow. So have a lot of opportunities there to get some practice in prior to the test on Monday. If you have any questions, let me know. Hope everybody has a great day.